watch a drama You say you wanna watch a comedy Well, you can watch it with your mama Or you can watch it with your daddy You'll even sit and watch it with your middle schooler So you can come and talk around our water cooler We'll watch it all day and all night Couch potatoes unite Whoa, whoa Couch potatoes unite Whoa of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point, which is based on a blog of the same name because this podcast is essentially the equivalent of our own book-to-screen adaptation. Only it's a blog-to-podcast adaptation. I know this joke is kind of lame, but Outlander doesn't lend itself easily to comedy. At least not yet. I don't know, but we'll talk about that in a minute. My name is Kylie, and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening, and we're checking out our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like. For Couch Potatoes Unite, we're all about the wonders and the unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU, exclamation point, hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays, and as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panels and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the website or the podcast via iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, by Google Play, Spotify, and now on iHeartRadio and CastBox to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including, but not limited to, Supernatural, Orange is the New Black, Gotham, The Marvel Shows on Netflix, Stranger Things, iZombie, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, The Good Place, The Crown, Game of Thrones, American Horror Story, and Grace and Frankie. Plus, new episodes are in the works, including revisits for Altered Carbon, Doctor Who, Schitt's Creek, Westworld, Fuller House, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, How to Get Away with Murder, Will and Grace. We'll be launching new panels covering the break bad universe this is us the orville big little lies and the good doctor and because we look back at shows now past we'll travel through time and experience all sorts of identities with quantum leap and we'll thank the golden girls for being friends by the way did you know that cpu also from time to time goes live we've been live from bunkers comedy shows comic cons and game stores plus we're planning more live appearances and other cool stuff including in these semi-quarantine times so make sure you like or follow us at our Facebook page, or our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or subscribe to our website, YouTube channel, Apple iTunes channel, Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Play, Spotify, and on CastBox and iHeartRadio. In the meantime, if you don't hear your show in this podcast format, fellow panelists and I still write reviews and we always seek new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of those outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback, just don't send the red coats after us and or keep your rebellions nonviolent. This isn't the 18th century or even the 20th for that matter. You can. Today we're around the water cooler and taking a first look at the first season of a multi-season historical drama based upon a series of novels of the same name by Diana Gabaldon. The show is Outlander, and this is the first of a five-part series in which CPU catches up on the series, which airs its primary run on premium network stars. In this episode, part one of the series, we're discussing season one, which aired on stars from August 9th, 2014 to May 30th, 2015, with a total of 16 episodes. We will discuss each subsequent available season in each new episode of our catch-up series. By way of premise, developed by Ronald D. Moore, Outlander stars Katrina Belf as Claire Randall, a married former World War II nurse who in 1945 finds herself transported back to Scotland in 1743. There she encounters the dashing Highland warrior Jamie Fraser, played by Sam Hewen, and becomes embroiled in the Jacobite Risings. In season one, Claire and her husband Frank, played by Tobias Menzies, are visiting Inverness, Scotland, where she is carried from the Standing Stones at Craigna Doon back in time to 1743. She falls in with a group of rebel Highlanders from Clan Mackenzie, who are being pursued by British redcoats led by Captain Jonathan Blackjack Randall, also played by Menzies, Frank's ancestor. She marries a Highlander, Jamie, out of necessity, but they quickly fall in love. The clan suspects her of being a spy and retains her as a healer, preventing her from attempting to return to her own time. Knowing that the Jacobite cause is doomed to fail, Claire tries to warn them against rebellion. On Metacritic, the first season has a rating of 73 out of 100 based on 34 reviews, indicating generally favorable reviews. 
on Rotten Tomatoes. The season has a 91% rating with an average rating of 7.95 out of 10 based on 52 reviews. The website's critical consensus reads, Outlander is a unique, satisfying adaptation of its source material brought to life by lush scenery and potent chemistry between its leads. Outlander was popularly requested for discussion and beloved by some of our resident and adjacent couch potatoes, all of whom appear on this panel. In fact, around the water cooler today are two of our frequent panelists, one of our occasional panelists, two brand new panelists, and your very involved moderator, all of whom are ready to take on this wild romantic tale of a Sassanac and her suitor with vague notes of Wuthering Heights underlying the proceedings. As always, it should be noted that all of our panelists have watched all episodes of this series at least through season one and may discuss sensitive plot points. So for those of you who have not watched Outlander and plan to do so at some point, listen at your own risk as there may be major spoilers. At this time, I'd like to introduce the panel. I'm going to tell the panel how this works, but also remind you, listener, because we do have some new folks on the panel. But what I'm going to do is ask you to identify yourself by your first name, just your first name, not your whole life story, we just need your first name and then tell us how you came to watch Outlander what made you start watching how'd you find out about it what kept you watching that old chestnut and then what I'd like you to do is rate your interest in Outlander after season one and you're going to be doing this along the standard CPU character question which changes with each show we do is everyone ready for this part yes you must be vocal it is a podcast <laughs> <laughs> ready. Okay. ready. Yes. <laughs> so far, so good. So how would you rate your interest in Outlander Season 1 along this character question? Do you love this show? The fantasy aspects, the romance, and the appreciation and reverence for Scotland, plus the elements of action and adventure, all of it is just so exciting, even thrilling, and nothing like you've experienced before. How could something feel so timely to the future when so much of it is set in the past? Aye, you could watch this for days, you can. Plus, the leading lady isn't hard on the eyes, like James or Jamie Mackenzie Fraser. Are you of two minds about this show? The past sweeps you off your feet unexpectedly, even as you yearn for more of the story set in the 1940s. It's as if you're living two lives while watching this show, an experience that is full of surprises but also offers the occasional storytelling hiccups. Still, you will persevere, as you do with your love of the leading men, like Claire, Beauchamp, Randall, also Fraser. Does the history intrigue you? The mystery entice you? But the romance frustrate you in ways you cannot fully articulate? There's something missing from this show for you, but you're willing to keep looking until you find it, like Frank Randall. Do you care only for the story of the main characters? You watch for Jamie and Claire's romance to succeed, and you hope it does, no matter what the cost, as you're very protective of these characters and their love for each other, like Murtaugh Fraser. Do you care little for the plights of the main characters? It's the supporting characters that inspire you, as well as the history behind Scotland's earnest, if ultimately failed, efforts toward independence, like Dougal Mackenzie. Is it though the storytelling and the characters are fine enough to watch and in which to stay invested, so long as you don't have to care too much? You prefer to watch for the glimpses into feudal politics and related family dynamics, like Colin McKenzie. Did you enjoy the show quite a bit at first, but you also lost interest with all of the superficial exploration of pagan ritual and medieval justice? You wanted to know how Claire was transported back in time, but the show didn't answer this question fast enough for you, so you stopped watching. Or you stopped watching because, spoiler, you were burned at the stake for falsely claiming you were a witch like Gellis Duncan or Gillian Edgars? Or do you deplore this show, for it does not satisfy your darkest, basest desires, which you're willing to use whatever means necessary to fulfill? At least, the English make a strong stand, and the villain keeps things slightly interesting, but you're mostly too bored to muster anything more than feigned interest, like Jonathan or Blackjack Randall. Who would like to start? I'll start. Okay. Hi, I'm Samantha. Hi, Samantha. I've been on many a podcast with you ladies, most recently Westworld and Grace and Frankie. Let's see, how did I start watching the show? I love all things Scottish, so it had me at the title. <laughs> <laughs> so I got myself a premium subscription and started watching and just totally fell in love with it. 
So I say I would be 90 or 95% Jamie and maybe just a splash of Claire. Because I do wish for more 1940s action because that's another one of my favorite eras in history. All right. Welcome back to the podcast, Samantha. Thank you. Lori, I'm a historical reenactor, so I love anything that deals with time period stuff. I originally read the book years ago, and I spent a little time in Scotland, so the men are hot. That's all I can say. The men, Scottish men, are hot. Even at 60 years old, they're hot. Okay. And so 100% love the show, even though I'm a big fan of the books. The show does some wonderful visual and music. The music's awesome. So how would you rate your interest along the character question? I'm probably 50-50, Jamie and Claire. And Lori, what other panels have you been on for CPU? I did Wolf Hall and loved it. And I did the Tudors and hated it. Well, that was actually the same panel. The, we pitted them that was the same other. panel, but you can tell the tutors were did not hold up to historical standards. <laughs> and you were also on our look back at Battle Creek. Yes. Love the show. Wish they did more. Well, welcome back to the podcast, Lori. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Highly. Other panels I've been on, because if you've listened to other ones, you know that I'm one of the most frequent panelists, so you've probably heard my voice. If she you is click the on. most frequent panelist. Frequent. So, yeah, if you've heard a podcast, you there's a 50-50 chance you've probably heard me, but I'm on The Good Place and Grace and Frankie and The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, Doctor Who, Once Upon a Time. I've been on some Looking Backs, even like, I think Futurama was kind of the one of the weird, like, off-brand ones for me that I even did. But yeah, if if you listen to CPU, you've heard me. Oh yeah, Downton Abbey, another good one, another <laughs> historical one. So I love I love all kinds of TV, and Outlander kind of fits right into that. I love the cross-genre shows in particular. And so yeah, Outlander, a little time travel, a little history, a little romance, drama, it's got me all over it. So I started watching Outlander. I don't think it was right away. I think I waited maybe a year or two after it came out. I to start watching it. I just, I didn't have stars. So I waited till I got a really good deal. And I like watched the first three seasons. Loved it. Still love it. I've only read the first book or I listened to the audiobook version. So I'm kind of waiting for the series to wrap up or go through another drought lander as it was termed to read some more. But yeah, loved it. it yeah. The, with Lori, the, the men are gorgeous. That does not hurt watching it. The story's great. The music is spectacular and the scenery is just beautiful I, I can't it's so good it's so beautiful so that's everything that's kept me watching and so my character interest I would probably be a Claire I love the scenes set in the past I love the scenes in the 40s but I love the past more and there are some occasional storytelling hiccups but we'll get into that later all right welcome back to the podcast Kristen hi this is Karen I would like to go hi, I'm Karen, brand like new with this <laughs> and I'm brand new with this <laughs> I my name's Karen and I am new at this. The way I came to Outlander is I, I read all the books multiple times, plowed through all of them, just loved the books. So when I first started hearing hints that they were going to turn it into a television series, I was all about it. I was watching, you know, going online, doing research, seeing who they cast. So I couldn't wait for it to come on. So I've watched all of the episodes. From the very beginning, I've lived through all the Droughtlands, Droughtlanders, and I, I, I love the series. The, the things I like the best, same as many of the others, the costuming is just phenomenal. The, the scenery and the photography is spectacular. And they've really given it a kind of a female focus, which is a little unusual. And all of that are, are the things that keep me watching. I want to see how closely do they follow the books? What do they do differently? How do they get around some of the plot points? So I'm just fascinated with the whole thing. The character I probably associate with here the most, I'd say probably I'm about 70% Jamie, about 10% Claire because of plot points, and about five, well, let's see, I'm, I'm off on my math there. 80% Jamie, 15% Claire, and about 5% Dougal McKenzie because I, I love the history and the just the, the glimpses into the past and the failed efforts toward independence. 
Well, welcome to the podcast, Karen, and welcome to Couch Potatoes Unite. Hello, I'm Anna Laura. This is my first time on the podcast. And my first time on any podcast. Yay! So, woo, but I have a lot of opinions and I love nerding out. So here I am. I first came to Outlander, I think it was the summer of like 2016. I called it my summer of fandoms where I just had a bunch of shows that I wanted to get into and catch up on over the summer. So Outlander was one of them. And I was home for the summer in my parents' house in the middle of the woods with no internet. So I checked it out from the local library and binged it. And I loved it. Seasons one and two as well are two of my favorite like comfort watches. It's one of my favorite things to watch when I'm sick because it's still, it's familiar, but it's still exciting and still fun. And the I love all of the character relationships, like some of the others have touched on. I love the costuming. I follow Terry Dresbach's dedicated Outlander costuming account on Twitter. It's fun to scroll through. I love the cinematography and I love the music as well. So I feel like it's a kind of prestige show and a guilty pleasure show wrapped in one. All right. So which characters, did you say which characters you were on the character question? I feel like I'd be a mixture of Jamie and Claire because I do love the show, but there are some plot hiccups. There are some things later on in the show's run that I feel a little meh about. So, but the my love for the earlier seasons, the, the first two seasons particularly, is, is pretty strong. All right. Well, welcome to Couch Potatoes Unite, Anna Laura. <laughs> And of course, my name is Kylie. I both moderate and participate on this panel, as is frequently the case. I started watching Outlander basically because the five ladies you hear on this panel all said, Hey, are you doing an Outlander panel? Because I'd love to be on it. And also, Kristen was like, Why haven't you watched Outlander yet? And then Lori kind of did the same thing. And then Samantha kind of did the same thing. So everybody was like, tell me to watch Outlander. I don't know. What is this about? So that's how I found, well, I probably knew about it, but that's how I was motivated to watch it. I have kept watching and am moderating this panel today because I quite enjoy it. There's a lot to enjoy. I like the cross-genre description. There's fantasy involved. Gosh, I love fantasy. Wuthering Heights is one of my favorite books, and I didn't mention that idly. It reminds me of Wuthering Heights quite a lot, aside, aside from the toxicness of Heathcliff and, and Catherine. It's more like, you know, less toxic, but there's a lot of similarities, so I like that a lot. And I'm kind of interested to read the books now, but I'm going to keep watching because I've enjoyed it so far and hope to keep enjoying it. I would describe myself as a Claire, though. Is my adoration Jamie level? I don't know. I got to keep going. He's hot. Don't get me wrong. I just don't know if I am Jamie level love for the show, but I do. It does sweep me off my feet unexpectedly, and I do yearn a little more for the 1940s, especially in the back half of this season, which we'll talk about. And there, there's a lot of surprises to it, and that's why I'm here talking about it. So we're going to talk about Outlander. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, this is a first of a five-part series. This devoted panel of Outlander fans decided to talk about the series and catch up on the series season by season. And so as we've done with some other of our catch-up series, because I'm new to the show... I'm like the couch, the couch occupier and TV watcher that is watching real time right now. And all of them know more than I do. So they're going to try not to spoil it for me or for you. <laughs> but we'll do our best. Okay. Before we get too far into the discussion, though, because we are doing a first look today at Outlander, what I'm now going to have you do is rate the show overall along our star rating scale. If you follow any of the nerdy comic book panels with panelist Hillary, she calls it the star business. Basically, what I'm going to ask you to do is rate your interest in Outlander. You can think about this now at any point you're at in the show. If you want to think about it just as, you know, how you felt just as you watch season one, how you feel season five, or wherever you are in the show, you can answer it in whatever way it makes you feel comfortable. Just don't spoil. But you get to rate it along this scale. You can do half stars. Don't get too cute with fractions because math is hard and I averaged this out. Okay, so how would you rate Outlander 
as I'm asking you this question right now. Would you rate it five stars? Holy smokes, this is the greatest TV show you've ever seen in your whole life. It's so full of hot Scottish men and, and feudal politics. You just die every time you watch it. Five stars. Is it four stars? It certainly seems intriguing and you're trying to keep watching, but you see possible pitfalls in the premise. Is it three stars? Maybe you've only watched part of it or one season and you're going to give it more tries, but there are definitely things you like and things you don't. Is it two stars? Maybe you only watched part of season one and didn't get very far. Chances are you're mainly bored, but there's some intrigue or fascination that holds it together, no matter how unlikely and you haven't yet convinced yourself to keep watching, I don't think anybody's going to answer this one or the next one, but I offer it as an option. Is it one star? Pass on this one, guys. It's a snoozer. It's not funny. It's not interesting. It's too English or not enough Scottish. There's too many kilts and not enough red coats. There's just too many options on TV to watch this show called Outlander. One star. Who would like to start the stars? Five stars. Five stars. You want to justify your five stars? Well, there's a lot of historical accuracy in there with the costuming. Yes, they do take some liberties, but not a whole lot. They do try to keep to that time period or periods. The music's outstanding by Bear McCready. McCready, I'm McCready. not sure if that's but McCready. McCready, I think is the McCready. name. And the acting, of course, is excellent. With some of those scenes, I don't know how they got through them, but kudos to them. I'm also a five star for all the reasons she said. <laughs> and I just, I almost gave it less stars because you were saying when you were going through how you structure them, there are some parts you don't like and there are parts I don't like, but they're so well acted that I can't discount them for that. Okay. And it has fabulous rewatchability. I don't even know how many times I've rewatched it. I will give it four stars. You know, I do love it. It's a joy to watch. It is a guilty pleasure, but it's not one that I need to watch right away when it comes out. Like right now I've only watched through season three. I haven't watched four and five yet. And also there, yeah, it's historically accurate, which is great, but there's a little too much sexual assault for me throughout the series as a whole. So that, I don't know, not, not a big fan of that. I think that can be a little problematic. So, solid four. I think I would say it starts off at a five for me for season one and then kind of goes down to a four, particularly like seasons four and five recently just were kind of, there There were things I found problematic, which obviously we can't discuss because spoilers. But season one particularly is one of my favorite comfort watches. I love it so much. I'll rewatch it constantly. But I do... That I do have an abiding love for this show overall, and I will continue to watch it as it comes out, and I will rewatch it. So I'd say starting off at a five goes down to a four for overall, the show overall. Would you like to average that out to a 4.5? Let's average it out to a 4.5, <laughs> Kylie. All right. <laughs> I'm sold. <laughs> and mine's exactly the same as, as Anna's basically a solid five for seasons one and two and as we progressed into season four and five ran into some serious plot pitfalls that we'll discuss later but over overall 4.5 4.6 i'm gonna round down to 4.5 because <laughs> hashtag no cute fractions <laughs> <laughs> okay okay fair enough though and if i were to rate it as i've only watched season one but i would be at a four i think Kristen described where i'm at with it i like it a lot i enjoy it a lot i don't know if i'm at love just yet i can tell you that while i was watching season one i did feel a pull to want to keep watching and to kind of binge it a little bit which isn't always the case with the tv show so 
and I'm kind of excited to go into season two based on where season one left off. So, but I do see some possible pitfalls in the premise, and I think we're probably going to discuss them a little bit today. Although I know, just even from general discussion from the internets, from you fine women, from people that in my life that watch the show, I tend to hear the first two seasons are the best. The first two seasons are the best. And so I guess we're going to cover that and figure that out as we go. So let's talk about season one. Again, we're going to try not to spoil too much. This is now kind of the free-for-all question. I've given you some prompts in, in your talking points, which our listeners know that you get. But you get to talk about whatever you want to say, what you liked, what you didn't like, specific historical things that you want to discuss, anything. It's a free-for-all question, and I'll move the conversation as needed. What did you think of season one? Well, what I liked about it from the very beginning was how she narrated it and sort of pulled you in from her perspective and gave you that foreshadowing of, okay, something's going to happen here. We just don't know what it is and how kind of think you know where it's going as that first and second episode go along and then it it sort of takes you down another path at least for me than I was expecting from like a time travel show yeah I really appreciate that Claire kind of stands and almost as like an audience surrogate to help bring us into this world that they're building on both sides of the time traveling especially when it connects back to oh you know, I learned about this back in the 40s with my husband at this time. Like, not only the flashbacks, but she actually connects it. And I think that's really helpful for a first-time viewer. Yeah. And also, it's just it's just pretty. I'm going to keep saying it's pretty because it's very pretty. A pretty, pretty show. With pretty men. With pretty <laughs> men. And pretty women. Very pretty, yeah. So one of the things I'm curious about amongst this group of ladies is... I don't want to make this a Team Jamie, Team Frank discussion because we should all be Team Claire. (laughs) The general consensus is like Jamie's the one she's supposed to be with because he's the hunky Scott and he seems to get all the credit and Frank kind of gets the boot for, you know, all intents and purposes. But I like Frank and he was a stand up guy and I don't know why he doesn't get more credit as a husband. And that's where the books come through more, is more with her relationship with Frank. I think that's one of the pitfalls of the 40s, is you don't get to see her and Frank as a married couple. You see more in that honeymoon phase, because it's after the war, they haven't seen each other for six years, like intermittently, I think they said three times they saw each other in six years. So... It's a lot of foreshadowing, you know, when the ghost appears. And I think they did a more Scott-centric in terms of that first season with her and Jamie versus her and Frank. They kind of skipped over that part. Well, and you can almost see it in the first half of the season versus the back half where it's more, there's more 1940s in the first half and more of that flipping back and forth to show that sort of mirroring experiences with the two guys and just her experiences in life compared to the later half where it goes more really changing to bias Menzies from more of the Frank to Blackjack and really cementing that visual of the villain with him. Oh, yeah. Mm Because, of course, I love this so much. I have the DVDs. And I was looking at them the other day, and it had never occurred to me that the cover of the first, because that's way back then they were splitting seasons and two releases because capitalism. (laughs) (laughs) But the the, the first cover for the first half of the season is showing her in her 1940s clothing reaching back towards Frank, and Jamie's kind of in the background. And... On the second cover, it's got Blackjack's arm reaching out for her, and she's got a dagger to him, and she switched her clothes into Scottish. Hmm. So I thought, wow, that really kind of plays out how that season is split. Yeah, I thought I, I noticed that visual as well, and I thought it was a really good one for kind of how, yeah, the first and second half of the season's function as far as the first half of the season Her main focus is getting back to her own time, getting back to Frank. And then the second half of the season, she kind of has settled into life 
in the 18th century a little bit more and is kind of more focused on trying to make sure Black Jack Randall doesn't ruin her new life. Well, and I don't know that I'm far enough along in this series to be able to go team anybody right now. I, I noticed that there's far more Frank in the first half of the first season. And I think, you know, the visuals on the DVD are telling me that this right now, obviously they're trying to position Black Jack as the more prominent character that Tobias plays. You know, I don't have a problem with Frank, but since I just went through this season, I can tell you he's only in like half a dozen episodes. And then he, you know, there's that near miss at the Standing Stones at Cragna Dune, and then he's gone. You know, he, he leaves, he, he's convinced, he doesn't want to give up, but he's convinced to basically walk away from the search because they can't find her. So I think he's a fine, fine gentleman, but I also think she's trapped. Well, she's not trapped. She does make the choice to stay in the past at that one point. So I don't know, but she seems to have given up on her future life, at least in terms of season one. So maybe there's more information later, but I enjoy them both. I really like Jamie. He's very hot as well. We've been talking about gorgeous Scottish men. He is definitely my favorite of them all. And I, I like their fiery relationship and am interested to know more, but I, I'm not a team anybody yet. The one thing that I really bummed me out was the color of his hair in the tv show it is not the right color and that drives, that's one of my little pick picky things from the book because they talk about his fire hair and the temperament that goes with the red red fiery hair so that was my one big he's grumpy. still sort of gingery they talk about him having red hair he's a strawberry but in the book He's a strawberry blonde. Strawberry blonde, that's not good enough for you, evidently. (laughs) (laughs) If you've ever seen that true fire hair that's not dye. Oh, I have. I have friends who are gorgeous on that. (laughs) I don't know where to comment on the hair. (laughs) I'm just saying, personal critique, the hair color was wrong. Okay. That's a hot take that's going to come out of this conversation. (laughs) That's a big groundbreaking hot take that's going to come out of this. Hashtag the hair was wrong. (laughs) You look at the rest of him. Well, yeah. yeah. It's so right. Yummy. It's a (laughs) trade off I'm willing to make. I know. I know, but that was me, the takeaway from the book. Karen, what did you think? You're the other readers of the book. Well, you're right. I mean, they do talk about him having this fiery red hair but i i think they were just challenged they found a guy that they they liked the way he was built he was tall he was muscular he was young enough to play what 18 21 beginning and still mature to 21 okay and still mature well the book it's it's a little more he's actually younger than oh in the flashbacks yes yeah but to have the same actor be able to mature through the rest of the series. And they found a guy who was blonde. So they were struggling with, what do you do? Do you try dyeing his hair? They tried wigs. They tried, I think they tried half a dozen different things. His hair goes through five or six different color iterations. It's a little distracting. But then, I, you know, you look at the rest of him and it's... Well, the rest of him is distracting in a different way. <laughs> Yeah, I can't say that I was distracted by the hair. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't really paying attention to the hair, Lori. <laughs> oh, no, I, I did not see the hair switch. Well, it goes to his temperament. This is a point they haven't hit too much, is about, he's a what you would call a berserker. When he flashes, he goes crazy and in battle. And it's the link to the history, and this is the reenactment, of the Norse influence of Scotland with the fire hair, with the temperaments, and the Scottish history. And we'll see that more, I think, in episode two, I mean, in season two. We don't get into it in season one. Yeah, but you're right. It's that Viking history, Viking heritage. Yeah, you see it a bit where he'll have that sort of, like, flashes of of losing his temper, especially when she's like, I mean, she's very feminist for the forties. In its space. Ultra feminist. (laughs) 
Like, I don't even know that there's a level to describe how feminist she is for the 1700s. <laughs> so, but at least instead of just being like a typical guy of that era, he he's quite progressive. And smacking her? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, they kind of take that, they tone it down for the TV show. It, it's more predominant in the books about the abuse and sexual assault, which may be triggers for people. I get that. But they also show something you don't see very often, and that sexual assault on men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was describing for a mutual friend how I was watching Outlander, and they had watched it as well. And I said, you know, this was like this kind of frothy, politically historical romance, and all of a sudden it gets very, very dark <laughs> with this whole real prison quick. situation. Mm-hmm. And And they have documentation from that port of that happening. So kudos to Diana Gabladon for research. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, so to the feminist perspective, that's one of the copious phrases or copious praises of the show is that, you know, it's told through this feminist lens. And I, I think it's great. It makes Claire a very charismatic character and you with her narration although there is one episode that's narrated by Jamie which I thought was very interesting but it is mostly told through her point of view and I did feel myself kind of not having read the books I felt myself kind of not suspending disbelief at times just because I thought it's kind of fortunate she hasn't gotten herself burnt at the stake yet because she is so darn feisty and thankfully jamie is you know she does spoiler 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 this is in season one she does tell jamie that she's from the future and he accepts that but it it's it's very surprising some of the storytelling and how she's able to kind of dial back that feminism because she knows it's a matter of survival at the point but isn't always successful in trying to dial it back as well. So it's yeah, I, fascinating. I found that really interesting too, and it also kind of makes me think, because like obviously she's our viewpoint character, and part of the reason that she's so feisty and she's outspoken is probably because she's from the 1940s. And obviously feminism has come a long way since, but for the 1940s, like she is going to be much more used to being able to speak her mind to she was already a woman in a man's world working in nursing during the war you know she's she's from a time in history where women were you know people and had some rights and could vote so she was much more used to that but it also makes me wonder how many women who did live in that time, who lived in the 1700s and before, who had those feelings and had those thoughts, but did have to constantly repress them to survive. They weren't, you know, out of their time like Claire is, where she's not used to repressing these these feelings. She's kind of not trained to, I guess. You know, it makes me wonder, like, the the women, the other women, even that we see in the show, like, how many of them have, share her feelings, share her perceptions, and, but don't feel emboldened to voice them because they've, they've had to repress them and, and hold on to those feelings for their entire lives. Scotland was more free about women than England. Mm-hmm. And again, this goes back to the Norse influence. See, the Norse influence had the influence where the women owned the land and the, what was on it, the men owned the boat and the weapons. That does follow through. There were women lairds throughout history, even into the modern times, and they, the women were feisty in Scotland. They still are. But that's the difference of how the Scottish treater versus how Jack Randall is in disbelief that she would say something to him like that and the Scots are like yeah okay you go, you're crossing the line now tone it down and that's what you see there I guess very true yeah I guess and maybe that's just I mean I'm pretty well versed in this area of the world as far as its history but I guess it's one of those things that I maybe it gets teased out better in subsequent seasons the first season There's a lot of push and pull because it just seems like she's a woman out of time. It doesn't feel like she's in a country that allows for that, even amongst the Scots. 
you know, there is a certain, she's able to say more perhaps, but she's still put in her place. And it's hard also to ascribe any English moors to the other side when Blackjack is such an aberration all on his own. He's got a lot of dark things that are, are playing into his character that it's really, it's, you can't really use him as an exemplar, especially because when she's around the English, she feigns English and is English so that the other gentlemen appreciate her company. Blackjack just knows she's hiding something and keeps skewering and, and needling her until she gets feisty. So maybe this is something that gets teases out. I'm just saying that as, as a brand new fresh viewer and have never read the books, knowing the history, it's just very surprising some of the lengths that she's able to go to. It kind of drops me out of it. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, you know, but maybe, maybe that's okay. In Clan Mackenzie's house and, and Clan Frazier's house and... <laughs> Looks in the show. Look at his sister. I love her, by the way. She is one of my favorite characters, Jenny. I really yeah. hope that she's in more because when she comes on the scene, I'm like, wow, she's a breath of fresh air. And I love the fact that she fights with everybody. Yep. <laughs> yeah. she's great. And she's got that feisty quality, too, of like, don't mess with me. Oh, yeah. But there's, there's an example of a Scottish woman being in control. Yep. You were saying you didn't see it, but there are examples. And I don't, well, and I'm not ascribing Claire as a Scottish woman. I just mean a woman in the time, as opposed to any geographically ascribed woman. When we're talking about telling it from a feminist perspective, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so. well, there notes of that even in the 1940s where you can tell that she's, from my perspective, she almost feels out of time there, too, because she's so independent. Had, and I think it's hard for her to, to mold herself into that, okay, now I'm going to be a wife and mother and be in this structure now. After having had, even though it's awful, that what she went through with the war... I don't know how you pull that back after you've had that level of responsibility and freedom. Good point. Yeah, yeah I kind of wonder what would have happened to her if she hadn't gone back in time. Like, if she had continued on in her her own time. Like, would she have continued? Like, you know, she was kind of getting into herbs and finding different things to do with her medical knowledge. But would she have turned that into any sort of career? Would she put that have put that to use or would she have settled down into the wife and mother role like you said like I do wonder about that yeah, I just have a hard time envisioning that she would have done that long term like I think she would have maybe gone through the, the motions of it but there she has too much curiosity you're right and she didn't have like a normal upbringing either even for her own time like she talks about being raised all over the place with her uncle lamb and like growing up in archaeology digs and like all that kind of stuff like she's we're already told like right off the bat she's not a normal woman even for her own time so yeah she's she's definitely she's got to have some sort of adventure why not one that pulls her back 200 years speaking <laughs> of mystery curiosity and adventure this is the question that i'm in it the most to answer why her why there why then and where did it all come from? It hasn't been answered in season one. I hope it gets answered later. <laughs> I have to keep watching. Spoiler alert, it yeah. will. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm very excited. <laughs> not not this season, but yes, they will eventually answer that. Yeah. I'm very And excited. explain Loch Ness. And explain <laughs> Loch Ness, really? Yep. Well, it's in the book. In the book, yeah. It's in the book. Well, how about the water horse? Because <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't a book and then TV watcher. I started with the TV show, and I only went through and read the books like a year ago. So I think I made it through f like almost four seasons or four full seasons before I was like, okay, I can't wait to find out what happens because Droughtlander. I gotta go read the books. So it, it's interesting to see how the show diverges from the books and how much is left out because as a writer she tends to meander sometimes and it's like oh <laughs> cut to the chase diana why are they still like walking through the woods but so it's, it's just like the fellowship I, of the ring only in scotland yeah but this is the first series where i found myself able to enjoy the books as a standalone and the show as a standalone yes. usually i can't cross back and forth it's like you're either in one camp or the other and i don't find that with this series so that's a good 
compare and contrast. I'm going to pose this to Lori. Lori is not on our Game of Thrones panel, but has strong feelings about books versus show. I do. How would you compare the success of the adaptation here versus the success of the adaptation of Game of Thrones? I prefer the books of Game of Thrones over the TV show, and I wish the little troll would finish the series so we find out what really happens. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. And I am with Samantha on the... I, I am able to separate, for the most part, that, yes, they have to do things differently to do a TV show. I'm glad they did it as a TV show versus a movie, because I think it would have flopped as a movie. That would, that would be like two seconds for each plot point. It would be horrible. Right. right. You know, and they have to drop characters. They have to drop these little... But on the whole, very well done in the first two seasons, and I would agree with season three through five that... It kind of meanders off from the books, but I still get to look at hot Scottish men, so, you know, and hear their accents. <laughs> I see. That's the difference I, here, the hot Scottish men. <laughs> well, I was just thinking, when I say meandering, I just say, like, within the book. It's like, sometimes she tends to go on too long with the books and too many details. And everybody has their detail threshold, and... <laughs> You know, you can say that of the Game of Thrones. He does that, too. But the books are too thick. Oh, see, <laughs> see I would like them. That, that doesn't bother me. Yeah, the I would like page that. novel. I want to know all the things. I want to know all the things. I want to know all the things about Game of Thrones, and I'm finding myself wanting to know all the things about the Outlander. So that'd be okay with me. And, yeah, she, Diana Gabladon, researched the herbs of Scotland to make sure she got it right to where it grows and how it grows. Yes, that can get a little bit excessive at times, but I appreciate that detail that she just doesn't magically know it. She does research. She, she asks the local women... So what's what other uses is this? I know one use for it. And then the contrast of trying to go, you know, we don't have antibiotics. What can I use in lieu of antibiotics mold? You know, you got to go through that process of taking what she learned. And she probably was at a doctor level in the army, but couldn't be acknowledged as a doctor. And now she's thrown back in the 1700s and trying to make do when, you know, the people don't wash the instruments in between people, you know, just the basics. You know, it's funny you say that about the herbs, because that's one of the points that has bug that bugs me about the very first episode, is that they're, they're in Scotland, they're in October for salmon, and uh, Samhain, mm -hmm. and she goes up to the circle to pick forget-me-nots. Forget-me-nots bloom in the spring. I mean, just, it's one of those little bitty things. Somebody messed up. <laughs> just yes. as my, okay, you know, Lori Steele is the red hair. Mine was, <laughs> you don't grow forget-me-nots in October. Sorry. Maybe the forget-me-nots time traveled from the spring. <laughs> Use the <phones. laughs> Maybe. They are I think they did it because they wanted forget me not, you know, tie her memory to, but the they picked the wrong season. The symbolism is more important than the season. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and unless you're like me. Yeah. And then, <laughs> Karen does so not terrible. agree. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My picky point. <laughs> I was that like that with cute. tutors. Don't worry. I was like that with tutors and their stupid costumes. It was awful. <laughs> she oh, had yeah. spiciness. Well, even. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and the other, I guess the other one is everybody complains about the tartan. Well, they don't complain, but they use the same tartan for everybody. And all of the clans had different tartans. But everybody's wearing the same blue tartan. And they make a point of it in the wedding scene that Jamie's going to be picked out as this tall redhead with a distinctive Fraser tartan, and it's the same tartan that Murtaugh's wearing, and it's the McKinsey tartan. It's the same, yeah, not a whole lot of an explanation for that. <laughs> no explanation whatsoever. Okay. Everybody is wearing the same tartan. Okay, I won't tell you what the historically how it went then. <laughs> Laura, you can say. <laughs> well, it's... Well, the, the clan tartans that you associate today is modern. That wasn't in the right, 1700s. No. It was based no. on your 
a pin you wore to denote your your family, your specific family. And then their tartan was whatever colors grew near them, the plants that grew near them, so they would be similar. And it was right. whoever weaved them. More important was the, the pin your, that they wore. Your brooch. Yep. So the modern tartans aren't period at all. Those are That's no. all oh, no, no. very modern. Well, well then, you go with the super bright colored, like, tartans that people associate with now. So, well, like, the super hot light. pink is period. Yeah. Can dye blue like use plants to make hot pink? The only color that is very distinct is indigo, and that came from the New World. All yeah. the other colors in the rainbow, so you can dye really plants good. and get those colors. Right. Sorry, it's my historical accuracy is research. If you <laughs> haven't listened to our Tudors versus Wolf Hall episode, where Lori meticulously goes over the costume accuracy. Please find that at our website. Karen, you were saying? <laughs> That's a common here and now misperception about the Tartans. I understand. I'm saying and she's they, very they had You're very knowledgeable. Festive ones versus hunting ones. Karen, but what they were, were all muted. I mean, basically, they weren't the bright colors, but they all every clan sort of had a different weave or a pattern, even though the colors were mostly browns and greens. And maybe some blue, but they had their own patterns. That's that's the difference. All right, enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> Too much to keep track of. It's a, I, well, clearly we see who our historical devotees are in terms of <laughs> the costuming <laughs> of Outlander. So that's okay. So we've looked at season two. Put it on a hot dry. I didn't notice the tartan. That's true. Again, wasn't paying attention to the colors of the tartan. <laughs> I noticed the tartan on rewatch. I did not notice the first time watching the wedding episode that it was the same tartan, just because I wasn't paying attention. But I think it was like the second or third time I was like, "That's the that is the same tartan." And I was like, "Oh, okay, whatever." In this case. I don't care about, I only care about historical accuracy so much as I care if something is blatantly historically inaccurate, especially like because I'm coming to this show for escapism, I'm coming to it for like guilty pleasure a little bit, for comfort watching, like as long as it's not blatantly wrong, like just obviously the, there's no way that this could possibly be any sort of accurate I don't care. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for a good time. Hey, me too. <laughs> well, speaking of the wedding, I think if I had to pick a favorite, like I have favorite moments that are outside of that episode, but if I had to just pick one favorite episode of the season, I think that would be it. I would agree with that. Agree That's with a that. really good one. I love her episodes at Castle Leoc, like kind of acclimating with the clan and like learning about Scottish daily life and like all that stuff. I love the overall with this show, I think my favorite parts are always the daily life stuff, the family stuff, especially as you get into the later seasons. This always just seems to be my favorite parts of the story, and th those seem to be the, the bits that I gravitate towards upon rewatch. But yeah, the wedding episode, I love the way that it's structured with the kind of flashing back and forth within the episode and the way their relationship is presented because they are kind of thrown into this this marriage together and they're neither of them were really planning on this or at all or anything like that. Although like as a viewer, I was like, mm, I knew you were going to end up together. I saw that coming a mile away. <laughs> you know what? Well, it was foreshadowed. Oh, yeah. The first episode. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep, the palm reading from her. That's who He's, talked about her two well, lives. That, but the ghost. Oh, yeah, the ghost. I, the ghost. I, Jamie's ghost. As if time travel weren't enough. That's Jamie's ghost? Oh. That wasn't answered. <laughs> <laughs> Won't that get answered later on, since I haven't watched it up to the current N Not day? in season one. We're not going to say yes or no to that. <laughs> Can you tell me, me after season one, though? Did well, they answer the, the connection in the book? Sorry, book versus. Yeah, it might be. A, it might be in the book. In the, in season one, we only see the ghost, and the ghost is discussed, but it is not confirmed who the idea. I mean, you get the suspicion that it's Jamie. Who else could it possibly be? 
unless somebody stumbles into those standing stones or whatever. I mean, that's kind of where it's left. They visit it in the first half of the season, but they do not revisit it because in the second half of the season, she's completely in Scotland the entire time. And once yep. once Frank leaves the scene, he's decided he's he can't keep searching or he's, you know, trying to find a new life for now at the advice of the innkeeper in Inverness. They don't they don't revisit the concept of the ghost. So I did no, I did not know who the ghost was. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I suspected I it was probably him. At the end of that episode, the way she, op- you know, she catches her ring, puts them both on, and how she opens her hands to look down at them mirrors back to having her palm read and the forking and the two really, you know, parallel relations. That I remember very clearly. And in the subject of favorite episodes, I think I have three. One is the wedding. One is the one when Jenny has her baby. Oh, yeah. And the, the other one is the witch trial, just because that's where Gellis gives her real name and says 1968 or whatever. She, she's she been hinting this whole time. She knows, I mean, it's clear she knows that Claire is not from a, is more than just a Sassanac in all ways. But then she actually betrays that, and I love how the different characters that Claire has sort of encountered, like the priest that tried to exercise the sick child, and that horrible little girl that just has this deep and abiding crush on Jamie, whatever her name is, <laughs> just oh, makes all this trouble. Oh, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a fabulously staged episode that's very memorable for me that witch trial business so i'll be the outlier and say the scene the best emotionally wrenching awful scene you can think of beautifully done is the rape scene the male rape scene i won't spoil it or anything but it was difficult but the way they filmed it totally amazed me because i knew what was going to happen in the book And I'm like, how are they going to do this? How are they going to do it? And I thought they came up with a beautifully awful way to do it. It's definitely effective. Yes. That's for sure. I hate it. I cannot rewatch it. Every time I rewatch it, I can't. I skip every single time. I cannot do it again. But yeah, like you said, it's definitely effective. Yes. it's, It's memorable and it's haunting. And when that happened, I needed at least a day's break before I went back to the show because I'm not surprised by the scene and I think it happened far more often than is discussed in history but it was it was I was not expecting this I mean they talk about other shows on the premium Game of Thrones is a fine example where this kind of thing is depicted and it, we're talking about we're not in the middle ages but we're not far from it in this series so it didn't surprise me that it happened, but it was, it was very haunting, and I don't know that I could rewatch it either. But then you go on to the next one, which is the rebuilding and the healing, and how he struggles, and even further down the line, this is going to come back and haunt him. Of course. And other things happen throughout the series. But, you know, that's what history doesn't talk about. It's what we don't talk about today, about that particular subject. And to address it and be able to do it and not shut people down is a pretty amazing feat. And that's why I have such mixed feelings about it. Because as a viewer, far too much rape, far too much sex. That's not what I like watching when I'm watching TV. But when you go back to that trying to be as historically accurate as possible, I can see why it has to be in the mix. And I'm glad they portray it in a realistic way. Yeah, I think if they had, like if they're going to include that, if they had tried to gloss over it, try to kind of soften the blow in any way, especially since you're depicting something that... Even today, we don't really talk about the fact that men are also often the victims of sexual assault. And I remember, I remember when that episode came out, it was before I got into the show, but I remember the online discourse swirling around and it did bring attention to the fact that yes, this happens. It happened, it still happens, and it's something we do need to discuss. So I especially 
think like if you're going to include a rape scene in in anything I think it needs to be well done for you know so many different reasons to make sure that you are handling this very sensitive subject well but it's especially if it's an aspect of that subject that doesn't get as much representation that needs a little bit more of a light shed on it. I think then that that kind of upticks. I do think that they did a good job with it. And also understanding that the benchmark for talking about sexual assault in 2014, 2015 has moved on, especially considering the fact that in the in the time in between then and now the Me Too movement has happened and the way that we talk about sexual assault even from when this episode originally aired until now has changed drastically which also kind of makes watching the more recent episodes interesting but yeah the way that this show started off talking about sexual assault especially for the time that it was originally being made I think was pretty pretty groundbreaking and I know you mentioned Sam's performance and it was heartbreaking and he did such an outstanding job I have to mention that I was not familiar with Tobias until just this year when I watched the third season of The Crown, where he was playing Prince Philip. And I did not realize that he was playing Frank's... I knew he he played Frank, but did not realize he played his much more evil ancestor, Blackjack. And I know a lot of praise is given to Sam, but shoot, Tobias Menzies is a heck of an actor. He has got range. And I'm yeah. kind of a perma fan now just because I've seen him do so many different things at this point. One of them being this extremely dark character who doesn't necessarily see, he, he rationally recognizes the immorality of what he's doing, doesn't really care completely, and looks at it almost from an academic standpoint of having to fulfill some sort of base darkness in him. And I, The fact that he analyzes it and does it with this sort of constrained coldness, it's very, very chilling. And I, did he get nominations for awards? He should have gotten awards. He should have. He (laughs) did not. He should have. It's, it's. They haven't given a lot of awards to Outlander. It's all been going to Game of Thrones, which he, Tobias was in Game of Thrones. He played a coward. Edmund Tully. I know. (laughs) I was like, that's Edmund Tully. Yeah, that's true. That's right. He was the Tully guy before I saw him as Prince Philip. But that was such a small part. (laughs) So, so look at the scene from a historical aspect of the English breaking the Scottish. It was all about breaking him. And there is a whole psychology of wearing. And he broke somebody that he thought he never could break. But how he broke him... And how he subsequently comes back from that is where the story lies, both as country and as the people. So we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about a lot of rich subjects and a lot of what we like. Is there anything in this season, aside from forget-me-nots blooming in October and whatever <laughs> your costume issue was? <laughs> red hair, red, red hair. hair, red hair. <laughs> Besides those things, was there anything else that you specifically didn't like about the first season? It's not so much that I don't like it, but every time I rewatch, I skip through the parts with Frank in the 40s. I'm really sorry. I know some of you have ex- expressed love for the 1940s. When I, I, did, I did read the first book a few years ago, and when I realized that it was all from Claire's perspective and we weren't going to be flashing back and forth between her her storyline and Frank's, I was really happy because <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> I think that they did a good job of making me feel like I should care, especially because it's such an important part of the show, the pull that she feels between her two lives and between her two marriages. I feel like they did a really good job of that. I, I do think it's a lot of it is a it's it's me. It's not it's not them. I have to agree with you. I the forties isn't my time period, so I'm like, yeah, I know. Get me back to the men and you know, kill. Yeah, for me, one of the like I think I like I said before, for me, one of the big things that I love about this show is the the inter character relationships 
And obviously Claire and Jamie are at the center of that. And then the the relationships that they build in the 1700s and that she builds with his family and with the Mackenzies and all the people that she meets there, like that's what I'm here for mostly. So the parts with Frank are pretty much just Frank. And I'm like, hey, Frank, buddy, you're cool. But like, bye. It's fabulous. I I know know you love him and I respect (laughs) that love. But for me, it just doesn't, it just doesn't do it for me. I'm sorry. I'll keep him to myself. It's fine. And he's all yours. And I enjoy enjoy the show. Like, I understand, like, I do think it's, it was a genius idea to cast Tobias Menzies as both Frank and Blackjack. Because, like, obviously Blackjack is his ancestor. It totally makes sense. That gives Tobias Menzies, like, a little bit more of a chance to shine. Because if he was just one or the other, especially if he was just playing Frank, he would not have really had as much of an impact on this show that he did end up having. I think a part of it for me probably is the fact that because of that, I do associate the two. So I'm like, with Blackjack, it's like, I hate you. You're awful. You're an interesting character. You're a really well done character, but I hate your guts and I want you to die. (laughs) And with Frank, it's like, listen, you look like a person I hate. (laughs) It's like, to be really niche, the British officer that helps Claire in the mid-season when she, they're collecting rents, who's played by Tom Brittany, Jeremy Foster is, is the name. I'm a Jeremy Foster stan. Tom Brittany is the name, is the actor's name, and I love him. He's also on Grantchester. He looks, he is a dead ringer for my toxic ex. Oh, no. But, and it, which oh, gives oh, me oh, very good yeah. feeling. <laughs> It gives me very weird feelings watching him and things. But he, I, 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 look in, I look into his eyes and I'm like, listen, you haven't hurt me. You are not him. You are not the same. Frank is not Blackjack Randall. But I still don't care. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, and you may have to delete this out, there is pieces of Jack and Frank in the books. And... Mm-hmm. A little bit in the series, just a tad. I'm not going to delete that because I actually, as a viewer who watches a lot of TV and knows a lot about story progression, I expect to see something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't think I don't I don't think it's lost on me as a viewer that the fact that he so closely resembles this man who is his great 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 whatever it stands to reason that genetic material would also translate to personality and so i'm actually as a viewer who's just learning this story anticipating that i'm probably going to see moments like that yeah i mean that's a common thing when you you know there's a reason they're related it's more it's a storytelling device that is used in situations like this and there's a reason for it it's not just oh we're just going to make these two related because we can. It's like with her work, there is a reason. So it's going to be fun to see that unfold a little bit. But I, I'm still curious. I mean, I know, Anna, you said you don't care. But as the, as the first time viewer, I felt the loss of the 1940s in the back half of this season. And I'm over here wondering, where's Frank? You just, you just decided Jamie was your life and that's it? That's all? You had the choice. That is part of it, though. That is part of it. As a first-time viewer, I felt what you're feeling now. Okay. It's that on re- upon rewatch, like, the second time I rewatched it, I think I, I watched through everything. It's just that at this point, I know the answers to those questions. So uh, now, <laughs> now I'm jaded, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also the piece of Claire of going and... Where can she do the most good? Can she heal more people in the past versus going to a system that won't accept her after the war, but only as a nurse? Look, I'm sure these are all very acceptable arguments. I'm just talking about my in-the-moment reaction. You're, you whisk back in time. You've spent all these episodes saying, I need to get back to Craig Nadoon. And then you're there, and you don't do anything about it. You say, Jamie! <laughs> And okay, you know, okay, but do you think that pulling her away that she was trying to get back out of, like, a true desire to get back to her life? Or do you think she was trying to get back out of obligation? Because I feel like it was out of obligation. Well, like, that I'm she was, like, sure. I should probably, like, I should, this is what I should do. Like, not like an, I, I actually want to 
live that life. The way I, think I the beginning, she wanted to go back to the forties. Yeah, the way I reacted to it at the time is that I don't think she would have consciously known anything about wanting to stay back in the 18th century. I think part of it was, yeah, part of it was maybe automatic, like, he's my husband, that's my life. But I also think on a conscious level, she was thinking, I do want to go back there. That's where my life is. That's where my loved ones are. But clearly there's a draw there with the handsome Scott, and she's already back there, and Maybe she was curious to see the family home. I don't know. I'm I, just still This there. is my, my, my take. My hypothesis is that she couldn't go back because she couldn't look at Frank without seeing Jack. Oh, yeah. Quite possibly. Mm-hmm. And I, I would see, okay, yes, quite possibly. I would buy that more after the end of the season. At the point at which she actually has the choice... To go back to Cragna Dune, had, had she already been in the Englishman's presence and he tried to rape her at that point? Because I feel at like that came once. after. Yep, at least once. I mean, definitely a lot of, a lot of crap goes down after she makes that choice with Blackjack. I feel like if she had gone back at that point, it definitely would have been awkward. Sure. Not gonna lie. Sure. Especially because, like, the first time they meet, like, in the first episode, he kind of She's does, caught- does some... Yeah, she's yeah. taking it back, and he rips her clothes off and yeah, tells her she's like, like this not, not a great start the there, buddy. <laughs> not a great opener. <laughs> Maybe say hi first. I don't know. <laughs> Low bar, but <laughs> so like, yeah, I think if she had gone back at the the point that you're talking about, like when she has the chance mid season to go back, I think with Frank it definitely would have been awkward being like, hey, you're a dead ringer for this guy who was, you know not very nice to me to say the least but I don't think it would have been as traumatic as you know going back after the events of the the second half of the season for sure but she was to not go back she was going to touch the stones and she was ripped away by the red coats true but at some point she gets she was pulling she almost touched it and she pulled away yeah Tyler, you're talking about when Jamie takes her back. Correct. Yes? When yeah. Jamie okay. takes her back. You're talking about when she runs away. Oh, I forgot about that one. On her own. The two. Oh, I think I the red coat pulled her away. She was gung ho, like I'm going back through the stones. Yeah. Back to my old that, time, that time she was going for it. Like she was heard Frank. Just, and she heard Frank through the veil. Yeah. Frank was yeah. calling for her, and she was calling for him. But that that does establish the timeline, because if the red coat yanked her away, then her second moment would have been after Blackjack tried to mm-hmm. sully her. I like to go for words. <laughs> and the other thing is, I think she wanted to save Scotland. She wanted to save those daily people that she knew was going to get crushed after Culloden. Yeah, I I love that aspect of this show. Like, we talked about a little bit earlier, like, the lost history aspect of it. Like, there's so much more, just like as someone who loves history, like, I, there's so much more about history, especially about daily life, and about the, the way that things were, than we will ever be able to know, you know, in this life. So I love that aspect, and, like, the, the thought that maybe, we, like, this culture, this really rich culture that... Not a lot of people outside of that area know a lot about. Like, I think a lot of people, I know for, for sure, myself included, especially before I started watching this show, all I knew about this culture was the stereotypes and, like, a couple of stories handed down to me because my family is Irish and Scottish. But, yeah, and then understanding the extent that their culture was wiped out and the, the imperialism that was being exercised against them, I don't think people really realize how hard... England went in wiping out Scottish and Irish culture because we just think of them all as one thing a lot of the time here here in the states. I know it, but that's that's because like I said I'm familiar with the area. One side of my family is English, the other is got Scottish and Irish in it. So it's actually kind of a running joke in my family or was actually when my dad was around because my mom is the English family. She's a half English. Her dad was English. And then his grandmother was Scottish, and so it was always, they would barb each other on that front, which was kind of funny. So, speaking of knowing the culture, does anybody speak Gaelic on the panel? I wish. (laughs) 
do you follow along or do you turn on the subtitles? Because there are no automatic subtitles. You have to turn them on. Yeah. I it until you said that in your email, and I was like, wow, I never thought to do that. I've watched the show so many times, and I never know what they're saying. I feel like you can kind of infer based on, like, body language and, like, what happens in the story. But, yeah, like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Well, it's first like, of all, Sassanac is a cuss word in Scotland. It's not a nice term until Jamie puts it into a nice term. It's, you, you don't belong there. I got yeah. that general sense when it's first said. I think he, he delivers it in a very subtle way where he's like, it means outlander. <laughs> it, it literally does mean that. No, I know, but he, he does it in a way that undercuts, when he's explaining it, he's undercutting the tone it's supposed to have so that she's not offended. Because she, he, you know, he's all crushing on her from moment one. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't? I guess. <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> well, let's get into some first look questions. So these are questions that I typically ask in a first look. This show was developed and adapted by Ronald D. Moore. He's most commonly known for his work on Star Trek. I can attest as a Trekkie. <laughs> but he's all, he also developed and created the reboot of Battlestar Galactica, if you're a big fan of that show. And he's been on some other ones. He developed Outlander, so he adapted it from the books. Would you watch any other shows that he creates or adapts in future, past, present, or anything because of Outlander? Have you gone to seek out these I other projects? I've watched Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> you have? Was it before or after Outlander? It was before. Alan wanted, Alan wanted to watch it, and so I, it wasn't something that I sought to watch. It was something that I sort of watched as a bystander. Because he was into it. Alan is your lovely Star husband. Trek, I feel totally different about. I, I'm very much a Trekkie. Yeah, <laughs> Trekkie. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I would follow him. I, too, watched Battlestar Galactica, his version, before before this. And I guess I don't even notice any really similarities in the storytelling style off the top of my head. So I don't know that one that I would follow because his shows are... A certain way like the Aaron Sorkins of the world like there's always the same pacing and and themes yeah you know, I'd never heard of him so, so I've heard of you I've heard of the shows but I've never heard his name specifically so Kristen falls back on her I don't follow most creators answer <laughs> it's a running joke it but is for real yeah. <laughs> so I don't watch anything set in the future I don't watch Battlestar Trek who <laughs> any of that crap so <laughs> it, I look at actual content, not who directed. She likes historical stuff. <laughs> I, yeah, like, though I have not watched either Star Trek or Battlestar Galactica. I, I am not averse to watching things that are set in the future or watching anything sci-fi, although I do also have a deep abiding love for historical shows and period dramas. But yeah, it, those things seem so different than this. That it would be hard, like, I would not have known that he also worked on those shows unless I didn't know until you told me, like, when you when you sent us those questions. I was like, oh, I didn't know he was involved in those. I don't know that I would watch them because he's involved so much as people keep telling me I should watch them. Fair people, enough. People, people hear that I haven't watched Star Trek and they're like, what? What? And you call yourself a nerd? <laughs> Look, there's all Different kinds nerdums. of nerds. Yeah, there's all kinds of nerddoms, and all are welcome at Couch Potatoes Unite. And sometimes Thank you'll you. cross paths, and sometimes you'll be like me and Kristen, who just watches everything. So <laughs> here for it. Yeah. So how does Outlander compare to other TV shows in general for you? And how does it compare to other shows? Now, I don't know if there is another show that can be classified as a, quote, romance, fantasy, historical adventure TV drama. If there is, you tell me. How does it compare to, to well, things within a genre and in general? The only one that I can think of that is remotely, like, hitting all of the points that you said of romance, drama, history is Highlander. <laughs> <laughs> Which is my other favorite Scottish show. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> totally uh, agree. I mean, Adrian Paul, come on. All right, uh, I'm anticipating a Highlander panel forming now. <laughs> I 
surprised I haven't already suggested it. Oh, yeah, you might have. I'll <laughs> yeah, look. I would put it in my... Oh, I, I have such a struggle picking favorite shows, but it's definitely in my like top 10 or top 20 or whatever. I care enough to buy the DVDs, even with streaming. So that tells you how many times I rewatch it. <laughs> it's in my old faithfuls. It's in my it's in my tried and trues. I'll I'll go back and rewatch it every now and again. I'll go back and rewatch it like if I'm sick and I'll probably fall asleep eventually. That this and Downton Abbey are my two. I'm sick and I want to have something comforting on, but I don't want to miss anything. So it needs to be something I've already watched a million times. In my it's in my old my my tried and trues. My I always come back to you. I feel right, like guys. there really isn't anything in the same genre. I mean, you get historical TV dramas, you get romance, fantasies, but to get hit all, tick all those boxes, I can't think of anything else I've seen that hits all of the various boxes. So I really don't know that there's anything you could compare it to. It side is by side, apples to, or apples to apples. It is very unique, and I think even the time travel element itself is very unique. Because I feel like normally with time travel plots, they start off in whatever time period is current for when the show is made and then goes back. But this is starting in what is already to the audience a historical moment and then going back further. And also the fact that the time travel isn't facilitated in a science fiction-y way. It's not a time machine or a TARDIS or anything like that. It's more mythology based rather than science or science fiction based so even that even that element itself i feel like is very unique to this show yeah i i agree and this show definitely seems like it's in a class of its own unless you want to put it into the class of there's no other shows like this and there's other shows that are not like anything else that we could kind of compare to but and yeah it's you can't really draw a comparison you can draw comparison elements of how it relates to other shows out there with the historical or the romance or the drama, even a little bit of the action scenes that we'll come to see later on. But yeah, it's, I like what Anna said about it's, it's comfort food almost. It's like comfort television where I, in that essence, yeah, this is very close to like a Downton Abbey or not really Game of Thrones, but Game of Thrones keeps coming to mind just because it's kind of, there's a little bit of that fantasy element. There's the drama, there's the romance, there's a lot of the, the sex scenes. But yeah, it's, it's unclassifiable. So it is one of my favorite shows. The only show that I rewatch is Supernatural in Castlevania. Okay. For some reason, and I am not an anime person, is to draw comparisons, it's the epic, like Game of Thrones. It's an epic adventure that you're not seeing at all at once, and you're jumping from, and it will come out, you know, from time period to time period, as for the mythology, there is a mythology behind that and the fairy rings. And even to this day, they don't go near those fairy rings. There is still a very strong relationship with, and it's hard for Americans to understand because for us, old is 200 years or 300 years. For them, a thousand years is nothing. And so that's something that I think the American audiences may not always understand until you get a chance to go to a castle that is a thousand years old and put your hand, you walk the stones that these people have walked or the paths. And that's the draw, especially for me, because I love reenacting those time periods. And it, it's that, that connection for me. Yeah, I would agree that it, it's in a class of its own, I think is how Kristen ex explained it, and I would agree with that. I watch a ton of watchable entertainment, television, film alike, and I cannot think of many that actually compare to Outlander. I, I would agree. It draws elements from a little bit of everything. It echoes Game of Thrones to me a little bit, but not a lot, just because Game of Thrones is so vastly different. The closest thing that I can think of, quite honestly, is Wuthering Heights without time travel. I mean, it's that whole idea of being out in the moors and that very similar time period with this very tempestuous romance. They're less dysfunctional than the main characters in Wuthering Heights, but there's still that... Okay, bodies. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there's just, I think that's the closest thing, and there's not a TV show that lasts for seasons and seasons about Wuthering Heights. So for me... I need to watch more to rank it or, or think about it as far as where my 
where it is my personal favorites. And I will ask something like this question again when we get to our final Outlander episode, whenever that will be. But for right now, I, I do think it's unique, and I think that's its draw. If you're somebody who likes a lot of different elements of story in your viewable feasts, Outlander is going to give it to you, you know, and I think it's going, even though our panel happens to be all women, and maybe not accidentally, I'm not sure, I think there's something that will appear to the broader gender spectrum, because there's there's a lot of fighting and horseplay with the men, and there's the clan politics, and there's, we've hardly talked about Dougal and Colm, the, the McCaskill. I was going to ask about what everybody liked about them or didn't like. Well, I... I think Dougal is a fascinating character, and where we leave it in season one is that he, aside from orchestrating the marriage between Jamie and Claire, he's trying to recruit for the Jacobite Rebellion and tries to twist Claire's arm in a few situations and does it all on the sly because Colm, they have this sibling rivalry where clearly Dougal has some aim for power, but it isn't necessar necessarily or seemingly necessarily the lairdship, but Colm thinks that it is. So there's this whole tension between them. And I just, I think that's mm -hmm. fascinating and isn't, it's not the forefront of the story. It's a supporting storyline, but it's interesting to watch it because I think it, that seems to me realistic in the historical telling portion. And Graham McTavish. Hmm. Yum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Am he's, I wrong? No. He's a very no. handsome gentleman. He's a it? silver fox. <laughs> yes, a silver fox. <laughs> With a very nice brogue. With a very nice brogue. Yeah. There are such good brogues in this show. Yeah. And they're, they're real. They're Across real. the board, the brogues. Yeah, he's actually Scott, Scott, Scotsman, so with a real accent. <laughs> what an owl. They, I know. They made a point to only hire English for English, Scottish for Scottish, so that the, the accents, they had to tweak words and sam had to do a lot of speech to make sure he had the rough highlander instead of a lowlander i noticed that because like any like between watching the show and between watching his interviews and the way he naturally speaks it's like way toned down so i was like oh they toned that up He's for the show that makes a lot of sense and americans had to understand it if you go to the highlands when i was in inverness we had to really listen to understand because they are that thick. The only one that are worse are the Welsh. You go to well, Wales and good luck. Hello, listeners from Wales, if you're listening. <laughs> we appreciate your Welsh accent, but apparently it's harder to understand. I know you've all kept watching because you've said that. Everybody here is a devoted watcher, and I hope so because, you know, we have more seasons to talk about. This is how you wanted to do it. But here's the big question. This is, you know, at Couch Potatoes Unite, we feel a responsibility to our listeners as stewards of the television medium, vast consumers of quantities of television entertainment. We, we like to make recommendations or non-recommendations. So the million dollar question, would you recommend Outlander to others? Why or why not? Absolutely, I would, particularly if you're interested in historical dramas that have a bit of flair and you're not going to, it's sort of that bridge between documentary elements because it's realistic, but also the fictional elements and it, it weaves them together very nicely. I definitely would and I do for people like, like we talked about all the different genres it touches on anybody who likes any of those things. I definitely recommend it for people. I do sometimes go with like a little bit of an asterisk a content warning definitely because there are people who will definitely be triggered by the depictions of sexual assault and also there are some people who might just not want to see sex scenes at all i know for me watching these initially as a little little 18 year old initially it was it was a bit much at first but i'm a cool 24 now so i'm freshly 24 today's my first full day of 24 days. Happy birthday! Thank you! <laughs> but with with kind of those asterisks there, and like also like be prepared for some plot holes and be prepared for some kind of, like to suspend your disbelief in some points as far as the, the, the believability of the plot 
if you're here, if you got your like big brain mode on, your cynic brain on, you're probably not going to like this show. But if you're coming to it to have a good time, I think you'll love it. Yeah, I've I have recommended it. I mean, I I recommended it to Kylie that she needed to check this out a couple years ago, and look where we are now. Yeah, I, for all the reasons that have already been said, absolutely would recommend. And something that I said offline that I'll mention again now is that you know as I was rewatching season one in preparation for this podcast, you know my fiance sat down and started watching the end of season one with me, and I think I have to watch season two with him because he actually got kind of into it. So. Surprise! I don't know. People who I didn't think would like it, maybe will like it, so. I mean, my plans for after we're done recording is to keep watching it, so literally I'm going to start watching it again after we end this call, so. (laughs) (laughs) I'm with Kristen. I was totally sold on watching it, but Alan sat down with me and watched it almost continuously. I mean, he'd get up and walk out of the room. He wasn't as glued to it as I was, but for him to actually sit down and even spend the time to watch it, there were there were aspects that he obviously enjoyed and was drawn enough into the story to sit and watch it. So I think it might be interesting if you if you want, I could invite a male perspective for our next podcast. He may he may it may look a little less like a love fest. <laughs> Overall, he may have other points to add. So my husband watched every episode with me first time around. So he read the books. So these books are not bodice rippers, but <laughs> sex is displayed I just realistically. What you said. <laughs> it's a thing. It's, have you not heard that term, Kylie? You never heard that term. You never heard that. Oh my god! I guess I'm terribly <laughs> square. <laughs> the Harlan moment novels with like Fabio on the cover, where like the bodices were always like. A jar, a little bit. I didn't know there was a term <laughs> for it. <laughs> so think the 1980s and 1980s romance where it was, everything was rosy and glory and nothing bad really happened. It is not that way, but it's a lovely depiction. And for our next one, I want to talk about the music because the music is fantastic. And well, how many of you noticed that the... The opening theme changes. I have, yeah, I have the soundtracks. <laughs> so do I. Especially yeah. in the subsequent seasons, it'll change based on where we end up geographically, which I thought was a really cool. It reminded me. This is like very, very different show, but it reminded me of Psych. Oh, the theme song based on the content of the episode, like they do. They're like they they like translate it or do it in a musical style that reflects like they did their like acapella version and like their Hindi version for like their little like Bollywood episode. So yeah, that's what that's what it reminded me of. Love like But I will say, isn't the the lyrics aren't they a Robert Louis Stevenson poem? I believe they are. It's an old it's an old song. I know it's not. It was well, not the, written for the show. The it's music is very old, but the lyrics are fairly new. Yeah, that's what I'm, he would be a 20th century, most actually associated as a children's poet, but I'm looking it up right now because I feel like I read that and I was like, oh yeah, but just a well, second. the Sky Song was originally written about Bonnie Prince Charlie, about Correct. Prince Charles' yes. escape uh, to the Isle of Skye. Yeah, and then for the show, they they switched the pronouns to make it kind of about Claire. Okay, I'm confusing this with something else. That's fine. (laughs) (laughs) I read a lot. So, yes, the music's period, that piece. But there's other aspects of the music. If you have to skip episodes, you know, read read what's going on. Just know what happens. And read the books. I'm li- I'm re-listening to them. I'm doing an audiobook right now with them. We listen to them in the car, too. They're great. I need to get into them, because I read the first book when I was still in college, and I was a literature major, <laughs> so lots of reading, and I was like, okay, I'm intrigued by this. I'm excited to get into the books and, like, figure out the differences between the show and the book and kind of get, like, a different vein of the story. But I have not done so yet because, you know, I was a literature major in college and constantly reading books. And now I'm a librarian and I'm constantly reading books. Sometimes I have to go for for quantity. If I'm going to spend a lot of time on one particular thing, I've got to, like, really, really go for it. But I feel like I definitely will with these eventually. The other thing that you need to discuss is religion. 
and the part it actually plays between the Jacobites and the English and how it plays out between it gets glossed over in the TV. It gets glossed over, but if if you really want to get into why things happen the way they happen, you, you got to read your history book and understand that religion played in a big part in this story, too. Well, at this time, we've discussed wonderful, rich topics. This has been a very rich conversation, and I'm eager to go forward in these subsequent episodes. But for now, is there anything else that you wish to say that we have not already discussed about Season 1 of Outlander? Well, it seems as if the jury is silent... (laughs) And if the jury is <laughs> silent, what I have to do is thank Lori, Kristen, Anna Laura, Samantha, and Karen for joining me today to talk about season one of Outlander. But don't you fret, listener, we're going to be covering all of the seasons, but we'll be doing that soon. And first, we got to roll the credits. Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point was produced by Back Pocket Productions, run by yours truly, the Chief Couch Potato, which is really another way of saying executively produced by me. Kylie Piet. My associate producers are Krista Pennington and Celine Resmer. I edit this podcast and our logo is by Rebecca Wallace. Our marketing graphic artist is Krista. Our theme song was written by Sarah Milbratz and sung by Sarah, Amy McDaniel, and Kelsey Resmer. Kelsey played the keyboard, Ian McDonough played the bass, Christian Somerville played the guitar, and the whole kit and caboodle was engineered and produced by Kyle Aspinall and Christian. We hail from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. Give us stars, give us comments, give us reviews. Let us know how we're doing. Send us a message. We might just read it on the podcast. Tell us what you like, what you don't like, what we should keep, what we should toss. You know how it goes. And if you have suggestions on shows we might consider, contact us at our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, where we have a guest book, by email at couchpotatoesunite podcast at gmail.com or via our social media facebook twitter at cpu podcast and instagram at couch potatoes unite though of course we add new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time we always have several more new episodes coming down the pike just listen to our intros and if you miss old episodes or want to know in general what we cover just find us we are everywhere and searchable wherever you look for things on the internet you can search for us or you can subscribe at our website our channels our social media accounts Stay up on our new events and episodes. Until the next time, the first three seasons of Outlander are currently available to stream on Netflix, while seasons four and five, and really probably the first three seasons as well, are available through a subscription to Stars, either directly or via add-on to outlets like Amazon Prime. In the meantime, our Outlander panel will next reconvene, very shortly in fact, to talk season two and episode two of our five-part catch-up series. So until next time, until next episode, new episodes are published every Wednesday. Keep listening. Watching. Stay tuned. Bye. 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 Bye.